There are an endless number of concepts for tabletop role-playing games, with every genre known to man being covered by at least some game. I've played many different games myself of many different genres, but one concept that um, had never even crossed my mind was 1950s B-monster movies. But the B-movie monsters aren't really the point of the game we're going to be talking about today. This is a look at monster movie cinematography. It's not the monster that's the antagonist of the story, it's the sheep set and poor direction. It's a game about irony and tropes. And when you approach the game with that in mind, it becomes exactly what you're looking for. They came from beneath the sea. The game master of They Came From Beneath the Sea is called the director, and it's their job to introduce a mystery in the vein of a 1950s monster movie. It's a science fiction slash horror slash comedy game that provides the tools you need to make things both scary and amusing. The game knows that it's both horror and farce, and it embraces that, and it becomes the best it can be if you embrace that as well. This is also a story path game, similar to Trinity and Dystopia Rising, which have already been covered on this channel. I'm not going to be talking about the fundamental mechanics of the story path system in this video, because I've done so several times before, but if you're completely new to the system, the main things you need to know is that it's a game that uses a number of d10s in order to accumulate a pool of dice to represent actions. Any die that shows a specific number or more is considered a success, and you need to accumulate successes in order to overcome challenges. The game focuses primarily on narrative, but there are levels of crunch to it as well, and I think the story path system works well for those players who want a fair mix of narrative and crunch, without one overpowering the other. I intend to start a series on this channel soon called Walking the Story Path, where I delve into the basics of the Story Path system and compare the different Story Path games to each other. So if you're interested in that, make sure to subscribe to this channel. Something that they came from beneath the sea does different from other Story Path games is its use of quips. These are one-liners used in dramatic situations for mechanical bonuses. An important aspect of this game is that the mechanics are tailored for comedy. There's a level of metagaming involved in this game in the way that the mechanics act as tools for players to break the fourth wall. I'll go into more details about how this works later in the video. Apart from the fundamental mechanics, all story path games are connected by paths, though the paths themselves may change from game to game. The paths are a vital aspect of character creation and help build on the game's theme. In They Came From Beneath the Sea, the paths are the ambition path, which drives the character forward, the origin path, which makes them who they are, and the archetype path, which is the role in the story. The archetypes are arguably the most important of the three, since they help define your character's actions, behavior, and standing within the group. The game has five different archetypes, the everman, the g-man, the mouth, the scientist, and the survivor. Each of these have a number of traits, including specific tropes and trademarks. Tropes are special abilities tied to the kind of dynamic features these archetypes display in the B-movies. The trademarks are unique behaviors and actions they are known for. For example, the everyman's trademarks may include jack-of-all-trades and I can fix this, which should encourage players to roleplay in ways that correspond to those trademarks, however they are interpreted. Their tropes can include grit and determination, which lets them roll an extra die on actions outside of their purview, or an honest day's wage, which means that they can always bribe incidental characters to pick up whatever gear or item they need, as long as it makes sense. The mouth's trademarks in contrast can be something like You're hearing it here first, folks, or sly wink to the camera, and their tropes can be things like spotlight, which lets them roll an extra die when they are the center of attention, or monologue, which lets them hold a monologue and then move everyone's social rating up or down a step after listening. All archetypes also have a nemesis, where they gain a die on specified rolls against a specific classification of alien threat. Those threats also gain a die on certain rolls against their human nemesis in kind. For example, the G-man's nemesis is an alien classification called a spy, which can shapeshift and blend into human society. G-men get one additional die on physical-based rolls against spies, and spies gain a die on mental-based rolls against G-men. The scientist nemesis is the invader, which has easy access to world-shattering technology. Scientists have one additional die on social-based rolls against invaders, while invaders have one additional die on physical-based rolls against scientists. 
While I do like the tropes and trademarks, and I think they contribute a lot to the game's theme, the Nemesis system seems a little bit superfluous to me. I think it's easy to look at the Nemesis traits and then want to cherry pick your role based on what you know about the classification of alien threat in the game you're going to play, or perhaps be disappointed when the alien threat turns out to be something that benefits another player in the group but not you. So I think the archetypes offer enough of their own to not really need this extra detail slapped onto them. I've already mentioned that you need to build pools of D10s where the goal is to get the number of successes required to succeed on your action. In the store path system these successes are more than simply a determination of success though, they are also currency. And once you have enough of them you can use successes to not only overcome the difficulty but also to overcome complications or to buy stunts. Stunts, for example, can give uh, bonuses to future actions, while complications are added on top of tasks without affecting their difficulty. For example, an action may be successful at a certain difficulty, but there could be a complication involved that will harm you through the success. If you have enough successes to spend, you can get rid of that complication and both succeed on the action and do so without harm. Stunts in particular come in a few different forms. There are the complicated, enhanced and difficult stunts that are the same in every story path game, where you can give yourself slight benefits on the go to enhance the action. However, this game also has pre-written stunts that can be simple, flashy or daring, depending on whether or not you had one, two or three extra successes. There are general stunts available to everyone, such as the cunning strike, which lets you attack and retreat at the same time, or the alien senses stunt, which a character that's encountering an alien can use to sense the presence of hidden aliens or traps and surveillance devices left behind by them. The individual archetypes also have their own pre-written stunts, such as the scientist's minor adjustment stunt, which lets them alter a weapon to remove a complication from its attacks or let it penetrate a level of armor. The survivor has a stunt that can remove a combat condition placed upon another player character within touching distance. These pre-written stunts not only help the players enhance their actions, but they get to do so in ways that feel in theme with their roles. If you have used one of your trademarks, like that sly wink to the camera I mentioned before, and you have successes to spend, you can perform a special kind of stunt called directorial control. For each success you spend on directorial control, you can add or remove a detail from the scene. You cannot ask the director to undo something that's already established, but you can change something that exists or create something that hasn't previously existed. The only rule is that it must make sense for the story. Some of the examples in the book includes the first sequence of numbers randomly punched in to stop a missile launch happens to be the right one, the alien suddenly develops a weakness to an earth disease such as the common cold, or sirens are heard in the distance as the police arrive on the scene. This is where a degree of metagaming can be useful. All players share a common resource called a writer's pool, and every time they fail a roll, they get to add a rewrite to this writer's pool. The pool itself can hold up to three rewrites per player, and uh, the players can then use these to activate cinematics, enable additional attempts at complex actions, or add dice to their dice pools. Because this is a shared resource, a player needs the other player's consent to use the rewrites. This requires from the player to stop the narrative for a moment and pitch an idea to the other players and hope that they like it. I'm generally not a fan of mechanics that interrupt the narrative, so I would probably house rule that every player has access to their own rewrites in this case so that they can make their own determinations. I do like the system overall though because it's a form of failing forward mechanic that's a useful tool for both daring to take more risks in game and making failures feel like they still lead to some sort of progression. I mentioned cinematics as one of the things you can purchase using your rewrites. These are drama enhancing mechanics where the players change the direction of the narrative. By spending rewrites on cinematics, the players can manipulate the framework of the script. This doesn't mean that they throw the director out on his ass and take over the narrative. What it means is that they is that some 
creative freedom is given in the hands of the players. A few examples from the book are Ally of Convenience, where you can pay a rewrite to have an encountered alien show humanity for the players. Bad Dubbing, where you pay a rewrite to have the narrator translate a, a language that the players otherwise wouldn't be able to understand. Or you can pay three rewrites for a deleted scene, where you get to introduce a new element, set up a future advantage, or provide bonuses to an action. There's a long list of fun and creative cinematics that can be used by the players in the game. A good way to use them without interrupting the narrative is to print them out on paper so that the players know what they do and can quickly choose the ones they think are appropriate. Something else the players need to have close at hand are their quips. You can buy decks of quip cards to draw from or create your own. These are one-liners and are often witty or humorous. You start the game with three quips, with two drawn from specified archetype decks and one from any deck of your choice. If a player has had their character utter a quip in game, they need to then let the director and other players know. If the consensus is that the quip was appropriate, or at least amusing, the player gets a bonus on the role associated with the quip, as well as a role following it. Another interesting feature that this game has is that it rewards you instead of penalizes you for taking damage. As a character accumulates injuries, they gain various benefits. The closer you are to death, the more effective you become. It's an interesting take on a damage system, since most games will weaken your character the closer you are to death. Here, the bonuses you get from injuries and the risk that comes with being closer to death balance each other out. Even though the injuries make you stronger, you don't want a bunch of injuries because of the risk of taking one or two too many. Once you've taken too many injuries, you enter a death scene. Here, all the action stops, and the players aren't allowed to make any new dice rolls. Instead, the dying character has a moment to impart wisdom, hold a dying monologue, or take a few moments in the spotlight before they perish. So, you have your archetype, you have your trademarks and tropes, and you know all about directorial control, rewrites, cinematics and quips. You have everything you need to play a 1950s B-monster movie about aquatic aliens and communist brain-eating eels. The question now is how you portray these stories and what these stories are. And can you portray stories about other things? Yeah, kind of. The mechanics for this game are focusing a lot on metagaming and satire, so that's going to be prevalent throughout. Trademarks, tropes, cinematics and quips are essential for the experience. The 1950s less so. It's in line with the game's theme, but you can place the game in the 80s or 90s or 2020s if that's what you want. You could also strip away a lot of the satire and try to go for a more serious experience, but the mechanics themselves will likely maintain the light-hearted side, even if you try to make a more serious narrative. The book does a good job at describing the rose-tinted 1950s Stepford Wives feel they want to convey with this game. The game is aware that these 1950s are a romanticized illusion, but that's sort of the point. The movies depicted a certain kind of 1950s, and the game is about the movies more than it is about the era. It's the movies depiction of the era that's depicted in this game. A game of They Came From Beneath the Sea can take elements of these 1950s movie themes and make a story around them. As nuclear tests disturbed an intelligent alien species from the depths of the earth and they are now invading the small town of Small Town Cove, where you work at the army base and your wife is a Soviet spy. That's the kind of story you want to play in this game. There is a level of world building in the book as well, where an alternative 1950s is established through monster-related events, otherworldly situations and pseudo-scientific experimentation. If you need help building a world that feels in theme with the style, there's content in this book that helps you do exactly that. This brings us to the alien threats themselves. The game is called They Came From Beneath the Sea, but who are they really? Threats are divided into several categories, such as destroyers, enslavers, invaders, primordials and spies. 
Each category is befitting a different style of monster movie and all have a number of different creatures that you can use for your game. One of the destroyers are the aquatopillars, which resemble monstrous translucent maggots which struggle up from the sea and devour everything they can find. They can sense living things and charge their prey while gurgling like emptying drains. Once they've selected a victim, they don't stop until they are fed, destroyed or brought back to the sea. One of the enslavers is the killer kelp, which is a technologically advanced kelp born from the chemicals of a TV dinner factory and evolutionary acceleration ray of a marine biologist. These kelp are armed with advanced firearms and strange communication devices with small TV sets inside. They produce TV dinners as a source of income while using TV broadcast towers in order to send brainwashing waves out to people who have eaten their isotope placed TV dinners. One of the invaders is the Brain Eater Eel, which is a parasite that controls the mind of its host. An infected host stubbornly gives up habits such as smoking, alcohol or taking drugs, but instead gorges on fatty food. Meanwhile, the parasite feeds on their brain, which causes memory loss and mood swings before the host turns into a drooling husk. The eel's eggs later hatch and eat the host's body fat. One of the primordials is the Centipus, which is a beast from the Mariana Trench that emerges to destroy ships and terrorize coastlines. Battleships have emptied shell of the shell into its limbs and not slowed it down. Subs have fired endless waves of torpedoes without effect. The Centipus may not have any agenda other than to destroy and eat, but every time it comes to the surface, people can only hope it doesn't stay for long. One of the spies are the seahorse people whose empress transformed their people into human form so that they could infiltrate the surface and bring it under her heel. She's also sent normal seahorses augmented with marine telepathic abilities to pet stores and aquariums to gather information from marine life kept as pets or zoo exhibits. The goal is to have infiltrators in all of Earth's human militaries. They can transform from human to seahorse at will and they are bad at using technologies but good at using harpoon crossbows. Yeah. Those are only a few examples. The book presents suggestions for how to design the game's story as well, and it lists a three-arc structure with suggestions on what kind of scenes to fill each arc with. The director can decide to approach the game in a number of different ways too, which should be communicated with the players before the game. For example, if they want the game to feel like a low-budget movie, they should go out of their way to describe the bad sets, costumes, weapons and acting. If they want the game to feel like a big budget movie, the director can add characters based on famous movie actors and describe effects and alien threats in more detail. If the director instead wants to depict an art movie, they should have scenes that involve introspective character moments or political and philosophical declarations. If the director instead wants to turn the game into an exploitation movie, they should add content aside to shock or spread controversy such as um, exploring the politics of the time. Finally, the game could be run by a tyrannical director who is unforgiving towards the characters. I think They Came From Beneath the Sea is a very creative and original idea that can be used to create stories that can both be immensely fun and scary. The book is probably a bit wordy, but it's uh, well written and does a good job at introducing people to the B-movie theme through its presentation. The art style has some hits and misses, but the art that's reminiscent of the 1950s style is one of the best things in this book. Unfortunately, since the book combines a number of different art styles with some artists known from other Onyx Path projects, I think it looks too much like a typical Onyx Path book. This game, if anything, would have benefited from doing away with the traditional Onyx Path style and go all in on the satire. It's possible that Onyx Path is a little too comfortable with their style now and they would probably benefit from trying some new things in the layout and presentation. I'm a fan of the story path system and all of the quirky things this game added to the system really works to highlight the theme. I do think that this game would have benefited more from not using the story path system though. As I mentioned earlier in the video, the story path system provides a good balance of narrative and crunch, which works wonders for an action adventure game like Scion or Trinity. The main selling point for the game from beneath the sea is its narration though. This isn't the type of game that makes you want to pick up and learn a fairly crunchy system. This is the kind of game that you should just want to pick up and play. 
I think this game would have been perfect and more attractive if the system was entirely built around the tropes, trademarks, cinematics and quips, instead of adding them onto an existing story path system. It works, but I also think it works because I know the story path system and I don't have to read up on a complex system in order to play a satirical one-shot. However, this is the kind of game I want to introduce to new players who just want to have some fun without too much complexity. And I think the story path system can become an obstacle in the way of that. They Came From is a brilliant series that's a must-have for those who want to portray these kinds of stories. But because of the very defined theme and the fact that the game is made for shorter stories, even though longer chronicles are possible, I think the game would have been better if it's been made as a rules light system with a core book half as thick. I think it can be a hard sell for people not already into story path, but I also think it's fun and interesting enough to be worth effort if you're into the idea of the game and would like to have game sessions where you and your group laugh so much that you pee a little. I recommend this game because it's good, but I also think that Onyx Path could have done better if they tried to make this its own thing instead of just another story path entry. If you like this video and want to see more, make sure to like, comment, share and subscribe. If you're interested in my other projects, make sure to visit my Patreon as well. Until next time. They came from beneath the sea.